Welcome everyone to the 2021 Beaverick Summer Institute Unmanned Aerial System Synthetic After Radar, or UASR course. It's been my pleasure to be the lead instructor for this course this year. And along with the teaching staff, we welcome you all as we allow our students to show off the work they've done this summer. Synthetic After Radar, or SAR, is a imaging technique that uses a radar to image the surface of the world. SAR is typically applied not only by our nation's military, but also by planetary and climate scientists. This technology is even making its way into our everyday lives as radars are being integrated into commercial vehicles and autonomous ones at that. Not only do the students learn the theory, implementation, and application of SAR, they do it with an even more challenging context of using unmanned aerial systems or UASs, also commonly referred to as drones, as the platform on which these radars reside. The students working in teams have implemented all the software-based command, communication, and processing needed to completely realize such a complex system. Furthermore, they have developed the experimental processes by which they collect data, analyze that, and apply appropriate solutions to improve their performance the next time around, a pattern we call fly, fix, fly. The teaching staff continue to be in awe of not only the students' competency, but the sheer drive by which they demonstrate uh, their grasp of these concepts that are typically reserved for graduate level stu students or until professional careers begin. We hope that you'll see and appreciate the same excellent qualities in the work that these student teams will present today and encourage you to engage with them to learn not only more about the science and technology at Bear, but also how this course has shaped the perception of STEM and their roles in these fields. Thank you for your time. And once again, welcome to USR. All right, welcome everybody. Um, well, that recording aside, thank you for uh, attending our final set of presentations. So we have a wonderful group of students who are split up into six different teams who've uh, over the course of four weeks, like I've said, have developed a impressive uh, degree in complexity of software along with their understanding, of course. And they're going to present to you the combination of all that work today. And also at um, the end of this uh, session, well, maybe uh, at the end of the session, we'll be announcing our winners of our internal competition here. Um, so that said, uh, I'd like to begin with team one um, and they will get their material up. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. We are the UASR team one, and we'll present to you the work we've done over the past four weeks with a presentation titled From Signal to Scene, Forming a SAR Image. Next slide. So first, what is synthetic aperture radar? Ramu gave a bit of an introduction, but I'll just quickly run through this. It's a type of imaging possible in all weather and lighting conditions. So regardless of darkness or clouds or rain, it still works to produce a high resolution image like you can see on the right of the image on this slide. The one on the left is a comparison with optical photography. Typically, SAR hardware is mounted onto airborne platforms like the UIS, as we were talking about, and it relies on using technology to increase the characteristic of radar known as aperture in order to produce these high resolution images. For ground based radar, you would increase aperture by increasing the physical size of the radar, but with an airborne radar, that's not possible. So instead, you need to do it by doing it synthetically. Next slide. In synthetic aperture radar, the airborne platform, a satellite, drone, or plane flies in a path above and to the side of the area it's trying to image. So the target is not directly below, but instead to the side. And it emits pulses at regular intervals and then synthesizes or brings together the reflected energy to form a single image. That bringing together of all those separate pulses is what allows the resolution to be so high and makes the effective aperture the length of the flight path instead of the physical size of the radar. This first step, the scanning step, we control with our command and control software, communicating with an emulator on our, on our physical computers instead of doing it with a real drone since we were virtual. 
And then the next step is the back projection processing. And my teammates will talk about both of those on the next slides. As John mentioned, the first step in processing star image is command control. Um, in our case, command and control is done through an emulator as we don't have a physical radar uh, at the moment. Um, basically, what this system allows us to do is it allows us to send commands to the radar. We can send them configurations. And after that, we can receive raw data in form um, as packets that we receive back. Um, so an analogy of what command and control is, is basically you're sending postcards or letters to uh, a person, um, per se, and they will send you back um, the response. So that's basically what we're doing with, with this um, module. Um, we are using the UDP packet protocol because it has low latency and it is extremely quick um, on our on, on the client side. So therefore, we can receive huge amounts of data in an instant, which allows for rapid processing and a more accurate and precise image formation. Um, however, given this rapid delivery of packets, there are some uh, downfalls with this protocol. Um, as oftentimes in the real world, uh, there will be limitations with packet dropping or packet loss um, between the two uh, the two sides, and that could lead to some distortion in the in the raw data files. Um, so it is up to us on the command and control side to develop a set of software um, parameters that could you know eliminate these packet drops and help smooth out the code uh, even better. So yeah, um, after we have received the raw data, it is up to back projection to process it and to form the image that we will see. Next slide. So the next step after we collect our radar data is back projection. It's basically it's the process of turning the raw numerical data collected by the radar into an image that we can understand. So like from the left to the right. Um, the basic concept of how this works is that by using the ra radar's wave data at various uh, locations of the radar, you can, using some fancy math, calculate the reflectivity of each spot on the ground um, where the radar is targeting. So our process to do this was we started with a very kind of rudimentary implementation of the algorithm, just using like basic Python code. And it worked, but it was quite slow. And it had many inefficiencies and problems. Um, but that allowed us to understand the algorithm better and kind of ingrain it in our minds better. And as that, as our understanding of it increased, so did our ability to write more optimized code for it. And we began to implement vectorized functions with like NumPy and Pandas libraries. And uh, our algorithm runs many times faster than our original implementation now. While command and control and back projection are the foundations of our program and the two most important parts, there are also other capabilities that we decided to add. Um, the first one was our graphical user interface or GUI, which we created to more easily uh, run our program rather than having to run it manually through a command line every single time, uh, essentially resetting the program, we created a GUI where you could just input your parameters and run it in a much more streamlined fashion. And you could run multiple different things over and over for both back projection and command and control. While technically not necessary, the GUI did help to exponentially speed up the testing of our code and the actual usability and helped to greatly increase the usability of it. We also took on a vehicle detection challenge, which was given to us by the staff to uh, create an algorithm to uh, detect cars within an image and then to categorize their sizes. In th this field, we did not succeed as much as our other sections due to a uh, lack of time that we were able to put into it. And we just, oh, due to this lack of success, we decided to focus more on finishing up our command and control and back projection capabilities leading into the final challenge. Uh, next slide. Overall, uh, throughout the course of this course, uh, we learned to better collaborate and work as a team. Um, having to work on the same code base in GitHub, it can be very annoying at times. And we also learned uh, creative perseverance, um, figuring out unique ways to fix problems, for instance, our slow testing speeds, and our willingness to fail 
and recognize when we need to shift perspective or move to a different uh, system. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you to everyone who has helped make this experience possible, especially the great staff. All right, thank you, team one. Um, so we'll have our TAs who are moderating our questions if there are um, any that the team one can answer. Uh, were there any features that you tried to create that didn't work out and why? I can take that one. So oh, I guess the vehicle detection would fall into that category. We, when you, when you guys first gave us the challenge, we had come to a point in our command and control and back projection that we were looking for a new challenge to take on. And we started working on the vehicle detection, but ended up approaching it with too much of a brute force strategy. So just trying to find exact matches in images with the database files that you guys had provided. And while that worked with initial testing, it ended up being both too slow and too matched to specific images to work when then you expanded the field of view. And that ended up not really working out for us. And because we wanted to focus more on optimizing the code for the command and control and back projection for the final challenge, we ended up just dropping that as a feature. Uh, so aside from that feature, what was the hardest challenge that you guys encountered working on this project? I think I can take that question. Um, I feel like all the components were pretty challenging at the start, but like combining them together into the GUI and using them like using the command control uh, uh, software to, to get the data and then processing it. I think that like integrating all the components together was the most challenging part for me. Um, but like yeah, I think a lot of things here were pretty hard for um, our group, and I'm glad that we were able to persevere and push through these challenges. Uh, now that you've guys gone through this whole course, if you could say something to someone who's just starting the course for the first time, uh, what would you tell them? If you think your code can't be optimized any further, you're wrong. Anyone else, anyone else got something they want to add to that? <laughs> I think Gabe is pretty hit it spot on. Like, um, yeah, there are always things you can improve, always things you can change and make it better. And there's always room for improvement. Uh, I want to thank team one for their excellent work during the summer um, and for their fantastic presentation. So uh, thank you again. Hope you guys had a great time with it. So now we'll move on to team two. All right, so if we could Team two could get ready. Uh, all right. Okay. This is good. Yeah. Sorry. I keep forgetting Emily's not here today. So, all right, guys, the floor is yours. Yes. So, uh, Nino, could you please share a video? We have pre recorded our final presentation and so for a better presentation. Hi everyone, we're team two of the UASR program at BWSI and this is our final presentation. I'm Emily and I'm in the top right corner. I'm Nitish and I'm in the top left corner. I'm Constantine or Nino in the bottom left corner. I'm Tianzhou or TJ in the bottom right corner. So, SAR, or Synthetic Aperture Radar, provides 24-7, 365 day all-weather imaging of the surface of the Earth allowing us to quantify and qualify regions of interest as said very well by our wonderful instructor, Ramu. And basically the radar is sending and receiving pulses and forming an image with the data that it received. And here's some cool examples. And for the table of contents, first we're gonna talk about radar command and control, then back projection. We're gonna do a live demo and then talk about our lessons learned. Explain radar command and control. So for radar command control, it's basically just the communication between the host and radar. It processes the inputs and outputs, telling the radar, uh, scanning how many times, scanning for how long, uh, what movement it goes when collecting its scans, and what's the range of its scans. And it eventually receives all of the scan data returned by the radar to go into the back projection and eventually uh, process into a star image. So the graph right here on the, on the right is a general outline of 
the commands between the host and the radar. The radar in this case would be an emulator, an online simulation of the real-time radar since uh, due to the pandemic, we cannot uh, have access to a real radar. And the host would just be our code uh, commanding what the radar do. So in certain cases, we just post the radar, uh, it gives the radar the configurations of uh, how it should scan and uh, how long it should scan all that information. And eventually the radar would start scanning and giving back us, the host, all the scan infos uh, as seen right here. So this is basically a uh, example of how the radar and the host would uh, interact. On the left is our host and the code get uh, output by our host. And on the right is the outputs of the radar. All right, hey everyone, I'm Nitish and I'll explain to you everything about back projection. So SAR imaging as a whole is divided into two parts, signal processing and image formation. Signal processing contains of two steps called pulse compression and Doppler effect. And these two um, steps as a whole in SAR involves ordering scans and processing the values, usually amplitude and phase. And the radar usually takes care of the first part, but processing these values is something that we have to implement. And in image formation, we use interpolation to form our image. This not only makes our pro program faster, it also smooths the image out evenly. Interpolation, how interpolation works is that it assumes the values in between neighboring data points, and these values are layered on top of one another to make an image of reflectivity. And we use this by NumPy vectorization, which we had to research a lot on. And the integrals involved in these are not fun, as you can see in the big um, equation in the right. And these two steps as a whole um, make up the basics of that projection. Um, hello, I'm, you know, I'm just going to show you all the demo. Um, Normally, this demo would include our command and control code, but in the interest of time, we've kind of just cropped that bit out because, let's be honest, waiting for the emulator to boot up in the real mode is very difficult. So we're just going to show the back projection part because that part's really fast. Um, so here I am just going to run this in the terminal. Uh, we can choose an arbitrary length and width, but in this case, I'm going to do um, something that is 5 by 4. Um, center, it's relevant to a coordinate plane. We know where the radar is flying, so here it's just zero, zero. Uh, the pixel resolution is just how many pixels per meter. And this generates really quickly. So the connection between our radar, radar, sorry, our command and control and our back projection are connected mainly by the radar's command and control getting the data back from the radar and then just processing it into a certain format. And then in that format, it gets passed to back rejection and basically, you know, you get to do well, whatever you want with it, really. So the image is formed now. Um, and that is, that is this. This is our image. This is a color bar for reference. But if you don't know what this is, this is uh, Vincent Van Gogh's Starry Night. Hi, I'm Emily, and I'm going to talk about the lessons we learned. So our main takeaway was that respect, care, and trust for each other makes a team. We basically lived by this, and it made working in a team really fun and also productive. We also learned to play to each other's strengths and make sure that everyone was always understanding what was going on, even if it meant we had to project a whiteboard and figure some stuff out together. And we also learned a lot about problem solving with coding through this program. We learned that we should isolate problems using print statements and also that optimizing our code through interpolation, like Matisse talked about, was super, super helpful because it meant we could run our code so much faster and find those problems easier. And we also really learned how to ask for help, like how and when was a good time to ask for help, which is a skill that a lot of us didn't really need that much before. But this is such a complicated program that we knew when to ask help from our instructors. Thanks, everyone. We had a lot of fun with this program, and we'd like to thank the instructors and TAs for making it so much fun. And we learned a lot. Thank you, Team One, for the great presentation. Um, we've just been informed there appears to, or 
Do you guys still have more to do? Or team two. Sorry, my bad. Team two. Um, I'm going to go to our TAs who have some questions prepared. If you guys could lead off with that. Yeah, so what would you guys say the greatest technical challenge you, you face would be? I guess I'll take this one. Um, I think the greatest tech challenge that we had was probably going to be interpolation. And the reason I say that is because it took like a lot of time to figure out exactly how it would work. But you know, once it once it got working, it was really satisfying, and we didn't really have to change back projection at all after that. Um, actually, it got fast enough that we could add a progress bar, which uh, I think you saw in the demonstration we did. Um, and the and I think another reason that I'd say back that uh, interpolation was the hardest part was that command and control is very um, I guess modular in a way, and it's very you know block by block in a way that makes it quite easy to do the entire process. Uh, what's the most valuable skill you guys have learned or developed since going through this program? I'll take this one. I feel like the most valuable skill we learned is uh, how to collaborate better in the team. From the first day where we learned like where um, Lisa actually invited a speaker to uh, specifically talk about how teamwork, uh, we have developed like uh, mm -hmm team working throughout our uh, course of working together. And has, um, uh, as Emily have said in our presentation, um, it was very valuable. And uh, as long as we have like respect, care and trust in each other, uh, it's, we can go through anything and it's, we have become great friends, so. All right, and if you guys could have done one thing differently from the start, what would it be? I think I'll take this one. So. One thing that I learned or like I observed was like in the beginning of the process, we were like kind of like doing our own thing and like we didn't like really like trusted each other that well because we just like met each other. But like over time, we got to know each other a lot more and we trusted in each other a lot more and like we could like ask other people questions. And I think that was really helpful, you know, and like helped our understanding with the content and programming as well. All right, uh, what aspect of engineering your solution felt the most different from how you've worked projects before? Uh, so uh, maybe it's the part where of all the debugging, because like uh, maybe also because this course is an online course, so we don't really get to do uh, more of like the physical uh, work with like the actual radar, but uh, this course was more focused on like writing code and making it work uh, while also understanding the structure of radar. While before I came to this course, I was thinking that engineering may be like more developing while after coming, it's like so much debugging, like 80% of the time it's debugging while the, 20, the other 20% is like actual developing. So I think that's the greatest difference. All right, excellent. Okay, team two, thank you for a great final presentation and for the Q and A. Um, so let's uh, queue up team three. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Ferdov Nasjanov, and I'm from I'm a rising senior at the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. Um, my name is Megan Hoffman. I am a rising senior at Noble and Greeno School. Hello, uh, my name is Isabel Pinto. I'm a rising junior at uh, Los Osos High School. Okay, now we're going to begin our presentation. We have a pre recorded video that we're going to share and then uh, a demonstration. Share some. Okay. How about now? Yeah. Radar was pioneered in World War II by Sir Robert Watson Watt to give the Allies an advantage. It was revolutionary because radar is capable of seeing through clouds and other obstacles, whereas planes at the time could not. However, as with anything, there are always limits, and with radar, the issue is that the antennas cannot be long enough to produce high-quality images, and thus, synthetic aperture radar was invented. Synthetic aperture is basically a technique that makes up for a shorter antenna by taking more pictures. Synthetic aperture radar works by accumulating data on a small region of interest through thousands of scans. Once this data is gathered, it is run through the back projection algorithm, which gives a signal amplitude for each pixel at every scan. This is done by calculating the Euclidean distance, or the range, from the aircraft to all pixels, 
Then, every pulse data is aligned so that the original amplitude at each pixel arrives at the same time for all pulses. This is repeated for every scan. The amplitudes are then integrated and graphed. Our first implementation used a chain of nested loops to loop through each pixel and scan, which worked and was very inefficient. Not to mention we had several errors that yielded us images that made little to no sense. And after hours of debugging and looking over our code, we were able to solve these issues. Then it was time to make the algorithm run more efficiently through interpolation, which sped up the projection time considerably. After many different implementations, our team was able to make the final code 300 to 400 times more efficient. We learned that by using multi-threading, NumPy, and other well-implemented Python libraries, we could vastly cut down the time. The next step was creating a radar interface to talk to the emulator. There was a very specific format our messages had to follow, and this was found in the API guide. First, we established that communications worked, and then we set the configuration of each setting. After that, our code asked for command of the radar, and then for information from the scans. We did most of this coding in a live share where we were all working simultaneously, and things were mostly going well. After testing the code, however, we realized a few problems. First, that we couldn't accurately track how many times a step was being retried before the code quit. Then, we had to solve for bit failures. After all of that, though, we were successful in creating a working radar interface. To make this radar interface more easily accessible to the operators, we then started on creating a website GUI. We quickly built the website, but then realized that connecting HTML code to Python code was not easy. We started researching Jenga and Ajax, but nothing we could find seemed to work. Eventually, we decided to focus on collecting the data from the website and then sending it to the radar. This turned out to be complicated because the server we were hosting the code on would not print anything in the console. After tweaking settings for hours, it turned out that the console was only connected to one page. We rearranged the pages and our data was successfully collected. Now that we had our back projection, website, and command and control code working, it was time to combine them. The command and control code would control the radar to collect data, which would then store this data and send it to the back projection code to form an image. All of this code ran under the surface. The highest layer was a website we created to accept parameters and display the final image. We implemented this by running the website, as well as the other two parts of the code, on a remote server. We used Lino to host our virtual server. This means that anybody who has access to the internet can go to the website and emulate a radar to form an image. Through integrating these three separate systems, we learned to work together as a team to brainstorm ideas and bring them all together at the end. Finally, the most important lesson we learned was how to work together as a team to create one final project. While there were a few bumps along the way, such as live share not connecting right, computers not being able to run the files from Git, or platforms that don't support the code we made, we were able to pull through. Though each of us struggled in different areas, our final product was able to accomplish the task at hand, and we felt proud of our work overall. On the final note, the three of us want to express our gratitude for everyone who made this experience possible. We want to thank the sponsor for making BWSI so incredible. We appreciate the amazing panelists that took time out of their day to give insightful lessons in the daily seminars. They answered many of our questions regarding college and career paths. Finally, I want to personally thank our instructors, Ramu and Frank, as well as the student assistants for the incredible work in putting together the programs to make this course as rewarding as possible, even in a virtual setting. And before we finish, we'd like to show a demo of our, we would, we would have done the emulator, but it would take too long. So we'll just show the back rejection code. So here's the website we were talking about. And it's uh, the home page where it shows like some of our pictures. There's an about us page with information about us in the video that we just showed. And then a run radar that has all the parameters starting with the emulator. All right, so this show, like this is for the emulator and then here it starts for the back projection. And I'll show a demo of the Mona Lisa one. And we'll do a, a from negative three, negative three. So the start means the bottom left corner and that's the stop is the top right corner. And the pixel size is how many meters or how much of a meter? How many pixels per meter? <laughs> That's all right. Um, Technical difficulties. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Meg. So pixel size is how many or what percent of a meter is going to be shown in the back projection image. And Freedavs is now gone. So we're not going to be able to show you the rest of this. 
but the website sends information to our Python code, collects that data, and then brings it back to a different page where it will put up the back projected image. I think my Wi-Fi cut out, so I had to rejoin. Sorry about that. No worries. So we're, we're running uh, towards the end of your window. So uh, while I, we'd love to see the live demo, why don't we move on to some questions just so we, we give that uh, some time. So um, I forget uh, which TA, is it uh, Mason or Remo is handling the moderation? Um, I'll be the one handling it. Okay, go ahead, Rima. So have you guys have any coding experience before taking this course? I had never had any coding experience with Python specifically. I use I know HTML, which is why I worked on a web on the website a lot. And then I had some Java experience, but other than that, not really Python. Okay. Um, I personally didn't have much Python experience um, before, at least at least before the course that we were required to take um, to prepare for this class. But um, I did take a computer science course, so I, I knew like some JavaScript, but not nearly as much as we needed. Um, for me, I knew a great amount of Python because I learned, I did like a self-study and then I had a class at school. Very good. Uh, would you ever want to be involved working with radar systems as a career? You guys can be honest. <laughs> I can take this. I don't think that radar is necessarily the path that I would want to go down later in life is how I'll put that answer. Um, for me, I really like the research engineer side of it, like making the back projection algorithm. So that's, I, after doing the course, that was something I was considering, maybe becoming like a research engineer where we get to, I get to implement algorithms and make them more efficient. Uh, personally, I think that I would prefer um, the more physical side of the engineering that we missed out on because the course was entirely virtual. But yeah, I had fun during this course. How has the complexity of this course changed your perspective on the effort that goes into real world technology? We didn't realize nearly how much, um, how much debugging we would have to do. <laughs> we, spent, uh, we spent so much time looking for errors. Um, I think Fear Doves, you spent what, like four hours looking for like three, a three letter command that was messing up our entire back projection. But uh, yeah, we didn't realize the sheer amount of effort and how, how perfect it has to be to, um, to have a working product. Great, thank you. Thank you, team three. Excellent presentation, excellent work. Yep. Okay, team four, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, well, my name is Abby. I'm from Pennsylvania and I go to Twin Valley High School and I'm a rising senior this year. My name is Firste. I live in Washington, D.C. and I go to school without walls high school and I'm a rising senior. Oh, okay. Hi, guys. I'm Sophie. I'm from Colorado and I go to Fossil Ridge High School as a rising junior. Hi everyone, I'm Catherine. Um, I attend Proof School in San Francisco, California, and I am a rising senior. Perfect. Welcome to our presentation on Synthetic Aperture Radar, made by me, Fresh Day, Catherine, and Sophie. This presentation will go over SAR, back projection, command and control, and the closing. Synthetic Aperture Radar is a way of generating an image using radio waves. Waves bounce off of the Earth's surface to detect physical properties. It uses a synthetic array instead of a real array to receive data from the scanned surface. The radar sends pulses for each slow time to the ground. There are different methods of data gathering. The two shown here are strip map and spotlight mode. Once the pulse data of each pixel of the scanned ground returns, we can integrate the aligned returns to calculate the so-called reflectivity of each pixel. This is how back projection forms an image. It takes the reflectivity of each pixel and puts it in a plot. Here you can see examples of SAR images versus optical images. SAR images can detect how reflective the scan surface is and are also useful in being able to see through cloud cover and the weather. Back projection also allows us to create cleaner images by not just focusing in the center. Here is our progress of a Mona Lisa data file. Since our first attempt, we have implemented several techniques to create an upright, cleaner, and high resolution image. We used vectorization to run the code faster, which allowed imaging at higher resolutions. 
We also use interpolation to create an accurate and smooth image. You can also see that the original data created the image with the X and Y axes flipped, so we ran the data differently to remedy that. In the bottom right, you can see our images for two other files. Interpolation is a NumPy function that takes three inputs. X coordinates at which to evaluate the interpolated values, X coordinates of our data, and Y coordinates of our data. It allows us to create regression with the Y coordinates of the data and evaluate on this regression for points we did not previously have in our data. Many calculations require to repeatedly do the same operation with all items in one or several sequences, which is usually implemented with four while loops. These loops are set to account for every piece of data in a sequence individually. These will make your code faster than accounting for each piece of data manually, but this will not make it the fastest it can be. For example, when our team first created back projection, it took close to 15 minutes to generate a low resolution image. To solve this problem, we started using vectorization, which is a method to iterate over a sequence all at once, saving quite a bit of time. This method helped us go from four or five for loops down to three. We also used this method to take our distance equation out of the innermost loop so that all of the distances would be calculated at the same time and not individually for each slow time. After all of the trial and runs and tweaking of the code, it went from 15 minute low resolution image to between a 60 second and a five minute high resolution image. This slide shows you all of the different types of data we have to use to create and plot our image. The command and control section of our code focuses on communication between the host and the emulator using UDP socket programming in Python. The emulator is a separate program that simulates the Pulsan 440 radar. The initial phase includes the host sending a message to the emulator requesting certain settings and the emulator sending a message back to the host to confirm it. We wrote code so that each time the host receives another confirmation message, we check all fields to make sure that the values are what we expected. After both devices are set up, the emulator proceeds to send scan data messages to the host. The client socket in the host keeps track of how long it waits to receive a message and times out once the emulator stops sending data. Next is data preparation. We sort the packets and check for missing ones. This is a consequence of using UDP to send messages. Even though it is fast and relatively simple, packets might get lost or out of order. Then we convert the encoded bytes into integers, substituting any missing data points with zeros. The final step is to feed the scanned data that we manipulated into the back projection code to form an image. One of the many lessons that we learned over the course of the program was the importance of collaboration. Having to implement and work on two separate concepts at the same time that would eventually link with each other made communication and splitting up the work vital. We also learned debugging strategies such as putting print statements throughout our code to help determine the problem. The following here is a summary of all the contents that we explained today. We just want to thank our classmates, our UASR staff, the Lincoln Laboratory, and Bob Shin. All right, excellent. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Team Four. Um, looks like we have a few questions. So, Rima? All right. Uh, so, it seems like you're giving a very vague set of instructions. How do you deal with that? I'm sorry, what do you mean by vague instructions? Um... Like, it wasn't very descriptive, uh, like how, how to like set up the coding and how to implement it. Yeah, so we took the, we thought, we thought it out through using diagrams and we created a whiteboard. And then once we had an idea of what parts fit with what, then we started, um, we collaborated on Google Doc. We wrote what inputs and what outputs were associated with each message or function. Okay. Uh, what challenges did you face when running the back projection code? I can take this one. Um, we faced a lot of like our range would be too small or too big, and then the resolution. Um, a couple times we got a, like a lot of zeros, which happened quite often. Um, so just figuring that out and figuring out like what part of the data became um, zeros, and it had a lot to do with like the reflectivity and the distance. 
um, we ended up figuring out that that was our problem most of the time. So, um, what skill sets do you think you improve the most? Do you think this will help you in the future? I can answer that. Um, I came into this with very minimal coding experience, and I think I learned a lot about working as a team and mostly like debugging because coding you can like kind of pick up, but I think there were certain techniques I picked up about like how to optimize code and how to like figure out what's wrong with it because that's what you're doing most of the time. So I'll carry that with me in my future endeavors. Uh, what's your favorite part of this course? <laughs> don't uh, jump! Don't all jump up at once. <laughs> so. I think the the teamwork aspect was really nice because it, it taught me a lot of things, like uh, uh, a lot of skills and learning how to use GitHub and just uh, understand concepts better. So I like that part of it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Team Four, for the great final presentation and for answering those questions. So we'll get Team Five queued up. Hi, my name is Sophia. Hi, my name is Mehdi. Hi, my name is Lucas. Hi, my name is Anish. And we're Team Five of the SAR program. Synthetic Aperture Radar, also known as SAR, is a method of radar imaging that overlays multiple scans of a set area to construct images. SAR is able to avoid aperture constraints of the traditional radar system by using scans from multiple positions of a set area. This technology is able to be operated in many different situations that would prohibit orthodox camera photography, such as clouds, rain, and low light. Currently, SAR is being utilized for military, ecological, and astronomical purposes, but has the potential to be utilized in many different fields as the technology develops. The back end of our program is handled by a main script that calls on the methods which communicate with the radar emulator. These methods send byte strings to distinguish with IDs to communicate the method type and receive byte strings back from the emulator. The sequence of communication is as follows. First, the emulator sends a communication check request, which initiates and checks connection with the radar. The radar passes back the values it received, and the client is able to cross-reference these values to make sure there was a successful connection. Next, the client sends the radar configurations. These are the settings that dictate how the radar will run its scans by determining values such as start and stop time and the resolution of the scans. The values are sent back from the radar for the client to check. Finally, the client sends the messages to activate the radar and the radar begins sending the client data as it collects. This data comes in packets that are accompanied by their IDs and configurations with the client parses. The parse data is packaged into a pickle file and sent to the back projection to be processed into images. This is our graphical user interface, otherwise known as a GUI. And this is where we control the configurations sent to the radar. Graph projection computationally forms a SAR image using data received from the radar. We took two perspectives when tackling this. The first, called moving radar, is slower but more reliable. We use it to image larger areas with lower resolution. Moving radar does this by filling in an image pixel by pixel with values computed from radar data. To optimize this, we use linear interpolation, which estimates unknown values from known values. The user inputs image dimension, pixel dimension, and center point coordinates. Adjusting image dimension allows us to zoom in and out. Changing pixel dimension adjusts the image resolution, and specifying the center point coordinates allows us to search for a target within an area. In addition to moving radar, we also constructed a different form of back projection called stationary radar. Stationary radar addresses the problem of calculating the distance between the radar and every given pixel position taking too long. It does this by calculating all the possible ranges ahead of time and then shifting our snapshot of the possible ranges as the plane flies. So instead of calculating the green square all by itself, we take most of the information that we got from the red square and use most of it in the green square and just calculate the little lip of the non-overlapping part of the red and green square, drastically reducing the computing time of the range. As a side project, we worked on determining the number of vehicles and the coordinates of their centers within a given back projected SAR image. Here is the result. I think we all develop the skills to work with other people, to listen to others, and most importantly, trust each other when one of us has a good idea.
BWSI has been a great experience because of our instructor, Ramu, who structured the course to provide a very similar experience to that of the real world, allowing for some serious practice with problem solving. At the beginning, working on a month-long project on a team filled with people I didn't know felt like an impossible task. But as we got to know each other, not only did the days seem shorter, but the project was a lot more fun. There were a lot of differences between working with a commercial device and your own code. Mainly, we had to rely on provided documentation to figure out the radar's requirements as we didn't have access to the source code. We split up into two groups to work on each system, and in the last week, we came together to integrate these two systems. This was one of the most difficult parts of our project, and we learned a lot about communicating about our a code effectively and using different methods to get the right images. In summary, we learned a lot about SAR and using a radar, even though we could only use an emulator. In the end, we faced many challenges, but we also had many successes. I believe we each learned a lot from these experiences and will definitely use these lessons we learned this month in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for watching our video. We'll now present a short demonstration of what we've been working for the past month. So in the top left and the left hand uh, terminal, you can see us how we are starting up the emulator, booting up the emulator. And we're initializing the radar data that we got using the from a file called offline data onefakeout So here you can see our GUI, which allows the user to input configurations to make sure what we're imaging is correctly within our range window. This allows for a much more streamlined user experience rather than having to Im uh, input the data within the terminal itself. Now you can see how we had our successful communication check, meaning we communicated with the rate uh, the emulator effectively and we sent the right configurations to the emulator. As you can see now it's collecting the data and now the collection is done so we can send that to back projection. So here is our RTI graph, also known as a range time intensity graph. This allows us to see the, the pathway of what we're imaging in relationship from the radar to what we're imaging. And the sideways parabola peak is where it's closest to the radar itself. And by, by uh, producing this graph, we're able to make sure that we're, what we're imaging is within our range window and that the lines are clear and therefore our resolution is clear. Um, as we can see with the code that I have here, this is the back projection main uh, part of the code that creates an image like this. Uh, this is the image dimension, so this is the size of the image within the real world. Uh, this is the pixel dimension, 0 0.1. It has a center of 0, 0, because that's at 0, 0, as you can see on the graph. And it will do about 30 seconds. And so each one of those brighter values represents an object that scatters the radar, the radio waves that are sent from the radar through pulses. And as you can see, we can create cool images like the MIT over there. And uh, that's that. Now we're ready for any Q&A questions. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Team 5. So, uh, Mason, you're our moderator for Team 5. So. Yep. So we have a couple of questions. Um, what was your favorite part of the project while working as a team? I think for me personally, I had a lot of fun like just working in like discussing ideas that we could have done for uh, different parts of the project. I was mainly focusing on command control, but still just like bouncing ideas off and work and trying to see what would work and what wouldn't. Also, this is a very hot take, but when we were all debugging at the end, that was pretty fun. Uh, what was the biggest challenge while working with the API? Sometimes I think one of our bigger challenges was trying to decrypt the byte strings. We had a lot of trouble making sure that our uh, in types were correct, which was weird. And that took a really long time to get right. But when we did, we realized it was because we were just not utilizing our library correctly, which was a bit frustrating. But um, I think we learned a lot about different libraries in the process of doing that, which was really informative. Yeah, you had to put this all together in a, in a final competition. What sort of challenges did you face to do that? So we faced a lot of challenges when doing integration. That took us 
like we came together in the last week to do that. And it took us way longer than we expected, mostly because we, after getting the emulator to work, we then had to go back to back projection and it wouldn't, and we couldn't, didn't get the right shapes for our data, which meant that back projection couldn't work. So we had to go back up to our emulator. So it was a lot of back and forth. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you team five for the fantastic presentation and the, and the demo. Uh, glad to see the emulator got a little faith, <laughs> got a little time on stage. Um, staff put a lot of work into that, obviously. So, all right. Um, so with that said, uh, we'll move on to our last team, team six. Okay, and team six has asked me to introduce them, so I'll do so quickly. So we've got Akash, Devin, April, and Jaja, who have, who make up team six. Um, and with that, uh, obviously, if you guys want to add any more to your introductions, feel free. Uh, but with that, the floor is yours. Hello, we are team six of the UAS SAR course, and this is our final presentation on our project and the lessons we learned. So first, I'll be telling you a really quick rundown of the base knowledge that you need to understand our work in this class. Next, I'll present the basis of our project, how we designed a system to communicate and interact with the simulated radar. I'll then explain the post-processing step of back projection, where we turn incomprehensible numbers into images. Finally, I will tell you about the next steps and extra projects that we took on. OK, so what was this course all about? Here's what we learned in a month condensed to around 30 seconds. The radar is a way of detection that sends and receives radio waves to detect objects. And even though you can't see it, radar can be used in everything from collision detection on cars to winning world wars. So how exactly does radar find the distance to an object? It transmits an electromagnetic wave which hits a target and part of the radar echo is then reflected back to the radar antenna. The difference in time, tau, between when the signal is sent and received is proportional to r, the distance to the object. There are many different modes of radar that all specialize in specific functions, and this court dealt specifically with synthetic aperture radar. SAR is used for surface level imaging to detect and classify stationary objects. The positions of the radar are at play in comparing these images of Venus. The SAR image is unaffected by weather, unlike optical imaging, so it provides a clear image of the surface. Moving on from radar basics, let's talk about how we control the radar. We have to be able to interact with and get data from the radar and prepare it for post-processing to generate an image. The technique we use for generating the image is called back projection, which we will elaborate on later. On this slide, we see a diagram of how the radar host will communicate with the radar. First, we establish communications and make sure the radar is running with the comm check. Once the communications have been established, the, the host will initialize the settings of the radar with set and get configs. Then the radar host tells the radar how many scans to take and will start receiving data that the radar sends back. After the radar finishes scanning, the host, sends, the host reads the formatted data and generates an image from it. In our implementation, we reboot the radar and radar host to reset the data collected so we can collect more data after the radar finishes its scans. To make it easier to control the radar, we create a GUI or graphical user interface that acts as a remote control that allows us to run each of these steps separately. So now that we can reliably get data from the radar, we need some way to turn that jumble of raw numerical data into some recognizable image. And that's where back projection comes in. Back projection is a post-processing technique which efficiently generates high resolution SAR images. It's an algorithm which calculates reflectivity or the brightness of data returned from each pixel. The algorithm we applied to back project followed these basic steps. We first correlated coordinates of the data to pixels so that we can pick a center point and where we'll start generating. Next, using the formula, we calculated reflectivity. We then interpolated the scan data, which made our image pixels more precise. And then finally, we repeated for each pixel making up the image. Although this process can create really high resolution images, a big caveat with back projection is that it's very time consuming and tedious because it works by generating an image going one pixel at a time. We counted for this by overall streamlining our code by removing any unnecessary functions, replacing and reducing number of for loops, and overall significantly increasing our back projection speed, in one case from about 30 seconds to nine seconds in one image. So just a quick little demo here. On the left, we can see um, our time graph for our scan data, which we then back projected to get the image on the right. 
Um, and if you can just take a quick guess, it's the MIT letters that we have here. We also had some extra projects to take on outside of command and control and back protection. Although the bulk of our time was spent on those main portions of code, we pursued extra projects to test the capabilities of our radar. We combined our newfound knowledge of radar with machine learning and Python fundamentals to attempt to create a vehicle detection system. We also explored creating a radar GUI and features like continuous scanning and a progress bar to give the user a better experience. In one of our classes, we discussed how machine learning is being used to classify objects in radar images, and later, the vehicle detection project was offered. We researched what object detection is, and we used the TensorFlow Python API to attempt to create our own model. Our main problems with this were the incompatibility, incompatibilities with our machines, so instead, we used the Python OpenCV libraries and an already created object detection model um, and created training data through the Darknet repository. Although we were unable to form sufficient models due to time and data constraints, we still learned about the role object detection plays in SAR imaging. And as talked about before, the radar GUI on the left is an easier way to set and confirm all of the parameters for the radar, including how long the radar is scanning for, how many scans to take, and whether to plot or back project the data. Continuous scanning was a function we were able to implement by following the radar's API and controlling the data intake through a keyboard interrupt and later data manipulation. The progress bar, inspired by our instructor's code, was an added feature to give the user an ETA and animation to show how long back projection was taking. Here are some of our key, key, key takeaways from the past four weeks. So I found that when we're working on a problem, it's always good to consider multiple approaches before sticking to one. A lot of the time, the first idea you have won't be the best. I learned that with complex code, it's really key that you know what exactly is causing the problem by testing everything individually instead of all together. I learned that in complex projects such as these, um, there are a lot of moving parts and some Python classes um, depend on others. So whenever you can try to optimize code before moving on so that testing it can be um, more efficient. And I found that working through and planning out our code before actually coding it is really helpful to work through logic and prepare what we're going to do beforehand. Finally, I'd like to thank the entirety of our Team 6, the UAS SAR students and staff, especially Ramu, Frank, Mason, Rima, and Winston. And a special thanks to Bob Shin and all of the BWSI staff for hosting such an amazing program. And now we'll give a quick demo. And while Akash is setting up the demo, um, we can take this time to answer some questions as well. Sure. Okay, Mason. Yeah. So uh, was it intimidating to convert that equation into a solution in your code? Um, I can take uh, this. Yeah. Sorry. Really good. Um, it definitely looks a lot scarier than it is. When we wrote out our pseudocode, we definitely got a better understanding of what exactly the equation meant. Um, when we take it apart and we just take it step by step, it's definitely a lot less intimidating that way. Okay, so I have the our radar host GUI up here. Um, let me know if you guys can see the entire screen. All right, okay. So on the top, I'm running the GUI. And then on the bottom, we're running the emulator. So we're run, we run it, and then it's initializing the data. While it's initializing, uh, here we've created some presets so that we can easily generate some Im images real quick. So we're using preset four for this demonstration. I'll just give a file name uh, so that we know the radar flight path. And now we can see that it's collecting some data. We, and eventually we should get a graph. So we can see the collection is done. And this is, Devin, you wanna explain? Yeah, so this is the graph of our scan data. Um, it's very helpful because it shows that we're scanning in the right area. Um, and these parameters are set by uh, the GUI and the set configurations. Um, so essentially, this is the data that we're going to be back projecting. Okay, here, and then to back project, since we're just using a preset, all we need to do is close this image, and then it starts the back projection. 
which you can see here, it's ongoing. And while it's back projecting, we can take some more questions as well. Yeah, so what did you learn about the engineering and coding process? Uh, I can take this one. Well, I found that it was a lot more tedious than I initially expected. Uh, it's a lot of iteration. You code something and then you run it and then you inevitably find that there's always something wrong and then you try to fix it and you just repeat the process over and over. But I ended up enjoying it a lot and this course was a lot of fun. Maybe we can speak uh, one more. Uh, did you feel prepared oh. or more confident about solving complex problems in general? I can take this. Um, yeah, I definitely felt uh, a lot a lot more confident in um, taking on big engineering projects. Um, this is the first like group coding project that I've done. Um, and it's it was great to see like real life applications of Python code. Um, in school, you're taught more general concepts um, and just general information in BWSI. Um, we were able to focus in on one specific field, um, UAS, SAR, radar. Um, and it was great to see how our implement implementations can actually communicate with other objects and, um, and form images. Okay, so on the screen, you can see that the back projection is finished. And I believe, Ramu, there should be a poll up for guessing what this is. Uh, yes, we just launched it. So for folks who are on Slido, there should be a, a poll on the polls tab. You can enter your guess about what this image is of. <laughs> so we'll give we'll give that a minute and we'll see see what folks. So maybe while we're waiting for the poll results to come in, are there any other questions, Mason? Um, not from audience, um, but uh, what do you think the hardest challenge was in the whole process um, from the emulator versus the back projection? I can take this one. So I feel like our biggest problem lied in the back projection, but not because of the code, because of but because of our um, machine's limitations. It, a lot of the time, our laptops would either overheat or they would start slowing down a lot because of the way our back, back projection implementation worked. So as a result, we had to a lot of the time reduce the resolution of, our, of the images we generated to increase the speed. Um, and I guess I can just add on to that. Um, we did try many different methodologies to actually optimize our back projection. Um, this ranged from calculating the pixel re reflectivities of every other pixel and um, trying a recursive algorithm and some other interesting ways to actually cut down and increase the speed of our code. Um, even though some of them ended up not really working, we did get to a good place um, near to the end where we could back project efficiently and get good images out of our data. So we're getting some results in for your poll. We've got clown, upside down face, ghost, and baseball field. All great guesses. Um, unfortunately, incorrect. It was actually the Kool-Aid man, but without his jug, so just his smiling face. Excellent. Uh, do you guys have anything else you're planning on presenting, sharing? OK, great. So perfect. Um, so thank you, Team Six. For the excellent presentation, the live demo, and the audience interaction. Um, so that brings us to the end of the um, the end of the team presentations. Um, that being the case, uh, it is now time, with bated breath, for us to announce the winners of the competition who will in a little bit receive their awards, but we decided to announce it here so that it's not a complete surprise um, and you guys aren't prepared. Uh, but I, I will say this, first of all, all the teams did incredibly well. We scored them on a, a number of categories um, for the full overall score, basically how well they work together, uh, you know, how well they sort of assume best engineering practices, how, uh, you know, how much innovation they demonstrated. And then there was a final competition, um, which had a really good response. Um, I will say that the teams were separated by very small margins. Uh, you know, the top four teams were separated by two points out of a possible 25. All right. So it was very tight. Um, and so no matter what, 
the result is, trust me, you know, you know, pick another day and the result could have been different. Um, so take, take away from this, you know, the fact that uh, you've all succeeded regardless of what the award number may be. Okay. So in a classic uh, sort of uh, build up the tension, we'll start with third place. Um, so third place goes to team six, team six. So Devin, Akash, Jaja, and April, congratulations on a team six finish, on a third place finish. All right, well-deserved, well-deserved. In second place goes team three. So Firdavs, Meg, and Isabel, congratulations on your second place finish. And in first place, just barely <laughs> is team one. So Gabriel, or Gabe, John, Jackson, and Nathan, congratulations. Congratulations. Again, the margins were extremely tight and admittedly are somewhat subjective because this, the, the, the difference was uh, the, the staff's grading of your image qualities. So, uh, so that's a, you know, uh, I did grade them all at the same time, so I won't I won't claim I was sleepy or cranky at any given moment, and anybody suffered from that. But um, but that said, um, congratulations to all our teams. Y'all did a fantastic job. Y'all did something that I know as a high schooler I would have never been capable of. Okay, um, so I can only look forward to the fact you know give yourselves the same amount of time I've had. You know, another twenty years or so. I can only, you know, I think it's going to be simultaneously uh, incredible and terrifying the stuff you guys are going to be doing because it'll be so far beyond anything I could comprehend. So I'm really looking forward to that. So with that said, we're just in time to go join the closing event where our three top finishers will get their names read out. I'm not entirely sure if there's something more than that, but um, we will recognize you there and you'll get your plaques in the mail in due order. Um, so uh, with that, uh, just another round of applause to everyone involved in the course. You know, for everyone, uh, staff, students, um, and of course our, our BDOS admins. Um, so Rod, I think we'll close it out here and the course is gonna move over to the final event.